So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's really like a pleasure to be here. My name is uh, William Pariente, and I'm very, very pleased and honored to introduce and moderate this session on uh, innovation in ICT methods. So celebrating uh, JEPA's 20th birthday is really the, the perfect opportunity to, to reflect on the evolution of doing RCTs since uh, JEPA's creation, and uh, of course, what, what we can expect for, for the future. So really, the objective of this session is to discuss some innovations in randomized evaluation. So there are lots of innovations, so we are only going to focus, on, of course, on a few. And we really have a chance to do that with a panel that is really uh, uh, a panel of experts who are not only doing a lot of RCTs, but who are also uh, reflecting a lot on how we should improve the methodology and how to make the best use uh, of evidence. So we are very lucky to have today four panelists that I would like to introduce uh, briefly. So we have Craig McIntosh, who is a professor of uh, economics uh, and finance at UC San Diego. He is also the co-chair of the agricultural sector at uh, JEPAL. We have Sima Shayashandran, who is professor of economics and public affairs at Princeton. And she also co-leads uh, the JEPAL's uh, gender sector. Uh, we have Poppy Widyasari, who is the Associate Director of Research at JEPAL uh, Southeast Asia. And we have uh, Dean Kalan, who is a professor uh, at Northwestern University, a founder of IPA and co-director of the Global Poverty Research Lab. So before giving the floor to, uh, to, to the experts, I would just like to say a few words uh, of, uh, of introduction. Um, so we've seen over the, the, the last uh, 20 years uh, a dramatic increase in the number of RCTs. So you can see here on, on this slide, so this is flow. You see by sectors that we are uh, going from a, a world in 2003 at the creation of uh, uh, JPAL where there will be uh, less than 100 uh, uh, RCT done every year to now if you take uh, all those uh, uh, sectors together to a place where we are uh, producing more than 1,000 uh, RCTs uh, uh, every year. And so this is data from the AEA registry. So it's really important to, to, to say that these are all RCTs and uh, not necessarily, of course, uh, JPAL RCTs. Huh? That's really uh, an important precision. And actually, if you would just look at uh, RCTs done by JPAL or by JPAL PIs, it would be, uh, of course, uh, uh, really like a, a small portion of that, which also says about the influence of, of JPAL in the, in the old sectors. So this is true in terms of diversification of sectors, but this is also true in geographic coverage. Huh? So you can see that uh, almost like every uh, continent now uh, are, uh, have uh, a, a lot of evidence uh, uh, based on, on our cities. So of course, what's striking uh, in, the, in, the simple, uh, in the simple figures is that uh, now there is a much higher production of evidence. Huh? And uh, then 20 years ago, and then if we would now take also the cumulative of all those RCTs, there is also much more evidence out there. And there are, of course, a lot of things that we, that we can do uh, about that. But besides just this uh, evolution, uh, evolution in numbers, it's uh, also important to say that the way we are doing RCTs today is not the same as the way we were doing RCTs like 20 years uh, ago, and probably not the same as the way we will do RCTs uh, in, uh, in 10 years when we will celebrate JPAL's 30th uh, anniversary. So uh, there are many innovations. So today, of course, we're not going to talk about all of them, but I just would like to say that there has been a lot of uh, innovation in analyzing experimental data. So now, of course, uh, with uh, uh, new methodology, with the, the, uh, the, the addition of uh, machine learning to understand treatment heterogeneity, to understand better inference. There has been also some uh, 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 different ways of designing experiments. So at the start, probably 20 years ago, uh, the, uh, the type of experiment we're doing is just one treatment, one control at a relatively like uh, a small scales at the pilot. Now there has been many, many different ways to design experiments that allow us to learn uh, much more on, uh, on many different uh, uh, issues. So for instance, you have adaptive experiments that uh, uh, use uh, uh, machine learning also, you have combination with structural model, we have a better understanding of general equilibrium effect. You are much more interested also by benchmarking exercises to also uh, uh, understand better cost effectiveness. So there, there is in the design also a lot of innovation. We have innovation also in measurement and we're also going to talk about that today. And measurement on our, uh, our, our way to, to improve 
uh, a measurement on, on, on um, measuring like difficult outcomes, uh, so on, on outcomes that are generally uh, with standard survey method difficult to, to get, but also there is the big revolution of uh, administrative data. And also because of this much higher production of evidence and uh, the existing evidence, there is also a lot of work on reuse of data. Uh, and so uh, how do we aggregate this evidence? And also how do we make uh, our, uh, our work more transparent and how we can also uh, increase uh, reproducibility uh, of, our, of our research. So like I said before, I'm not going uh, to say that we will uh, touch on all those innovations today, but uh, I would just uh, like uh, introduce briefly the agenda of what we're going to talk about today. So first, Craig will talk about cost effectiveness and cost equivalence. And um, he will uh, uh, tell us uh, how actually using cash ben benchmarking can be useful uh, to make like interesting comparison. Then Sima will discuss about innovation in measurement with a specific angle on uh, measuring uh, women's uh, agency. Poppy will uh, share with us our experience working with government uh, and using administrative data uh, to, uh, uh, to answer like very important evalu evaluation question. And then uh, Dean will speak about how to uh, generate evidence at a larger scale using like mega studies or using multi-site studies. So this is the program that we're going to start uh, in a minute. I just would like to just say something more in terms of the, the practical organization of the, uh, of the session. So each presenter will present his or her topic for around 10 minutes. Then there will be a short uh, discussion of five minutes within the panel. And uh, then after the end of uh, the four presentation and, and small discussion, there will be a Q&A uh, with the audience. Uh, so uh, we'll be very also happy to get your feedback and to get your, your questions. So now I will let the floor to Craig for the first presentation. Thank you very much. All right, well, thank you very much. We're delighted to have you all here uh, and to have a chance to uh, discuss uh, topics in research design. Um, so what I'd like to do is, is to discuss uh, the, the cash benchmarking approach that we've been taking uh, with my colleague Andrew Zeitlin over the course of the last few years, which uh, you, know, you may or may not be interested in this application particularly, but I hope to kind of motivate uh, the logic and the intent of head-to-head -head studies that are trying to deepen and make richer the way that we can have extremely comparable uh, studies that compare across multiple interventions. So, I think uh, a starting point is to say that we probably underemphasize the role of cost in general, or at least we have historically underemphasized this. Uh, we are all very interested in measuring benefits, and academics don't tend to find costs that interesting to, to think about. Uh, but, but certainly, policymakers and implementers will almost never be interested in, in benefits in isolation, and it's really benefit cost ratios uh, that they're interested in. So to do comparative studies that let you compare benefit costs ac across different environments, there are some very obvious problems that, you know, did you measure the outcomes in the same way? Are they over the same time frame? Did you target these problems in the same way? And then there are some less obvious issues which come up around if these programs are done at very different scales, you know, benefit cost ratios are basically linearizing the relationship between benefit and cost over some, some area. And it's not actually clear that they would have the same effect if you, if you made the comparison at equivalent cost. And so essentially what this agenda is about is trying to use the flexibility of cash transfers to set up a very transparent way of comparing across interventions in a head-to-head -head manner. So you may ask, and indeed Dean has asked us over the course of the years, why cash is a benchmark? It's just another intervention, and there's no particular reason why this would be the thing that you want to benchmark to. So I want to give basically four completely different reasons why cash is useful to benchmark against. The first of them is just mobile money is, is in some sense the cheapest intervention in overhead terms to deliver almost everywhere in the world. Now, the ubiquity of mobile money makes it easy to give cash transfers just about everywhere. The second one is that we know it works, right? So study after study after study, this is probably the best tested single intervention in the development space. And so we're far from having something that's like a standard of care, which is you know, a, a rigorously defined best intervention for a specific malady. But it is certainly an intervention that we have a strong 
uh, sense across many interventions, is, uh, many studies is going to work to push outcomes like consumption and food insecurity and uh, productive asset investment. Um, a totally different argument is cash is very flexible from a design perspective. So it can be targeted in lots of different ways, and it can be arbitrarily divided up to be transferred in different amounts. So you've got a very easy margin if you're thinking about, do I want to generate large benefits for a few people or small benefits for a lot of people? That's a very easy trade-off to form with cash transfers. Other programs may be more locked to scale in a way that makes it hard to do that. And then I think maybe the, the deepest and the most interesting reason why unconditional cash transfers are, are a useful point of comparison is that they very simply reveal what the beneficiaries of the program want. Right? This is just a simple relaxation of credit constraints. So there are certainly conditioned programs or there are highly framed programs. But if you give a truly unconditional cash transfer program, it's essentially a way of seeing you know, what do the beneficiaries of this program actually choose themselves when constraints are relaxed. This is not to say necessarily that that's the right choice, right? So one can still make an argument, for example, very poor people have a hard time thinking about the really long-term payoffs of educating children, and so I want to shift prices using conditional cash transfers. That's a, that's a commonly made argument. So it's not to say that you can't make that argument, but understanding clearly what people would choose helps to make that argument more concrete and crisp, because now preferences are revealed. So, all of these are, are sort of independent arguments for why cash transfers may be an interesting thing to benchmark against. And then the final bullet point, there's this, this kind of you know, very straightforward thing here, which is you know, so many organizations design really complicated, multifaceted programs that have many sub-implementers and lots of overhead and money sort of leaking out of the chain all the way. And so this is a simple way of just saying, hey, what would happen if you just took the cost of this program and gave it straight to the people that you were trying to benefit, right? So that's a, that's a simple touch point. So the, the studies that I'll, I'll briefly touch on today were, were conducted uh, in Rwanda. The funding was from USAID, and then uh, Berkeley's uh, Dill and Siga uh, helped us implement. Google uh, gave us the money for the, the cash transfers. So the idea here was to locate two big in-kind uh, programs run by USAID that were in some sense typical of things that they do elsewhere, and then come up with a way of doing a perfectly symmetric head-to-head -head comparison of those programs to cash transfers. So in the end, one of those programs was uh, an intervention aimed at reducing child malnutrition, very multifaceted program called Gikuriro, and the other one was a, a workforce training uh, and apprenticeship program called uh, Hugukurokore. So two design issues that come up with this. So one of them is you want to make this cost equivalent comparison, but you don't actually know the cost of the in-kind program before you begin with certainty. And so how do you guard against the mistake of getting the cost wrong? So our way of doing that was to basically bracket the anticipated costs and have three cash transfers that were intended to bracket the expected value. And then we basically pre-specified a, a regression adjustment that, that we were going to use to make it so that we're making an exact comparison at what we find out after the fact is the, the actual cost of the in-kind program. And then secondly, again, understanding the scale effects, we included a much larger cash transfer in both studies as a way of saying, what happens if you stack up a lot more benefits on the same person? Are things scaling in a linear way as the benefit cost approach would indicate that they do? Or is there, in fact, some heterogeneity, some, some nonlinearity over scale that we need to think about? So I'll just show you two sets of pictures and then wrap up. So the first of these, so the, the, study, uh, the, the health study is on the left. The youth study is on the right. And what we're doing here is illustrating the cost equivalence comparison that we can make. So the control group is the dark gray circle. The in-kind program is the black diamond. And then the cash transfers are the colored circles. And so what we're doing with a cost equivalent uh, approach is we're basically fitting the line that you see illustrated there. We are then extrapolating or interpolating that line to the exact cost of the other program. That's the hollow circle. And so then the cost equivalent comparison is basically a vertical comparison at the cost of the in-kind program that is saying, if we had spent that amount of money on the in-kind program in a cash transfer, what would have been the effect of that program? Okay, So this is an approach that is attempting to remove scale, to kind of collapse the conversation down on a single cost, which is the cost of the in-kind program, and then make a head-to-head -head comparison between the two interventions uh, at that cost. 
Now, in some sense, the standard approach, so these are exactly the same pictures, just connected up in a different way. So here, what we're doing is just connecting a line from the control group to each of the treatment arms. And since cost is on the x-axis and benefit is on the y-axis, the slope of that line is the benefit-cost ratio. So if every program had no scale effect, then what you would see is that all of the, for example, the colored dots would wind up on a line that they all have a constant benefit cost ratio and the benefits just scale with cost. So I think it's visually obvious when you look particularly at the right hand program that it actually does look like there's a nonlinearity. It does actually look in this program as if there's a thing as kind of too much cash and the very large cash transfers are actually discouraging effort and people are putting less work and, and uh, uh, less investment in when they get the very large cash transfers. So there does seem to be something here that is, is rejecting scale effects. And in fact, you'll see that for many of the outcomes, we find the moderate cash transfer to have higher benefit cost ratio than the in-kind program, and the very large cash transfer to have lower benefit cost ratios. So I think these two graphs are basically just simple visual ways of representing the kinds of comparisons that can be made when you have variation both across scale and across modality, and you know, hopefully kind of sharpen our thinking in terms of how we can set up programs to make really rigorously defined head-to-head -head comparisons. So, the conclusion here, if we actually talk about the results, you have to look quite hard through either one of our studies to find any outcome where the in-kind arm beats cash significantly at cost equivalent levels. So generally, our studies reinforce the fact that cash is not only very good at moving this, the outcomes that we're familiar with, but it's actually quite good at moving the outcomes that are critical to the other implementer as well. But these studies were a very heavy lift. Um, they took us years to design, lots of negotiation to put together. They're very complicated. In some sense, the results that we got out of our cash arm in this study are very consistent with the results that everyone has gotten out of cash studies elsewhere. This is an intervention that has a pretty externally valid uh, 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 impact. So I think moving forward, an interesting question is, well, if we always sort of know what cash is going to do, why do we actually have to go do the cash arm? So I think an interesting path moving forward and something that people inside USAID are working on, and I think Dean is also working on as well, is let's do a careful meta-analysis. Let's try to put together a simulation tool that lets us be able to predict uh, a mean and a confidence interval of cash impacts across a set of outcomes. And then that allows implementers to basically feed in program parameters for in-kind programs, simulate what the cash impacts and the standard errors of the cash impacts would have looked like, and then be able to do something that looks like cash benchmarking uh, this sort of second counterfactual as well as a pure control without having to go through building these head-to-head -head studies themselves. Just one question that is a bit practical and maybe uh, and then open to the panel. So in the linear extrapolation that you're making, so I was just wondering how, how the, the size of the, the large transfer matter in a way, because I mean, is it really sensitive to this or, or, or is it like, uh, or did you choose this very large cash transfer yes. among the one that is more like uh, around the 600? Yeah, so that, that's a great question. So, so uh, the, the cash transfers were implemented by Give Directly, which I should have said before. The large transfers were the number that Give Directly, based on their own internal calculations, believed to be the transfer that had the highest benefit cost ratio. So they were the ones who brought this kind of seven to eight hundred dollar range as what they felt was the sweet spot. Um, and I think uh, you know if you believe only the results from from the right hand study in particular, it looks like that number may in fact be too high. Okay. And a more like general question. So I really understand the added value within study, but of course with the now a growing body of evidence all over the place, is there a way you talk a little bit about it in the simulation part? To, uh, to do this analysis, but not inside one study, but across uh, a study. Yeah, so I, I, again, it's more, more I, difficult, I, I guess. It, it's certainly more difficult. Um, uh, and I think it's easier to do as you believe the linearity assumption yeah. under benefit cost ratios more. That gives you a huge universe of studies to compare to. If, if you're in the cost equivalence world and you think you need studies that had a very similar spend per person, then that, that limits the universe. Um, so I think the answer to your question depends on what you're willing to assume about how externally valid these cash impacts are. So I think having meta-analyses that 
uh, quantify the uncertainty in those predictions and again are simulating outputs that are not just giving you means but are also giving you standard errors and therefore something to reject and test up against is an interesting path forward. Yes, Mr. President. So, I mean, look, this question on the, you know, is it an S-curve kind of thing is so important. So I'm struck by, I look at this and I kind of conclude differently that the monthly income is kind of the same and productive hours is lower. So the wage, so the, so isn't the high allowing them to shift into some sort of, you know, high capital but fewer hours but same income activity and make more money per hour and work less and... Yeah, so I mean, I, I, like I, it seems like there's a shift in what they're actually doing to produce. I, that, that's income. right. So I mean, now we're getting into the details of yeah. what the study says. Basically, what the study says is that it is as if the high transfer is allowing people to simply consume more of the transfers. And so you do see the uh, consumption impacts looking much more linear. Uh, as, in other words, as if you had a constant benefit cost ratio. The question is, where is the money for that consumption coming from? What this study says is at more moderate transfer levels, it's coming from entrepreneurial activity. And at very high transfer levels, you're actually depressing entrepreneurial activity, and it's coming more from consuming the transfers. Sima? So, so cash ends up looking good in these settings, but I guess I'm struck that this stacks things against cash because the outcomes were chosen tailored to what the, the non-cash intervention was was doing. So how did you think about that? Like whether just to take as, yeah, it feels like in some settings that might be really yeah. underestimating the benefits. I, I totally agree with that. And it's, it's actually much deeper than that, because I didn't talk about it, but the, the entire targeting of, of both studies was completely driven by the other implementer, right? So mm -hmm. the one of them is, you know, households with pregnant women or children under the age of two. The other one is not just uh, underemployed youth, but underemployed youth who express a willingness to participate in the training program because we didn't want to get differential uh, noncompliance. So absolutely, you're right that everything is stacked towards the other implementers. And nonetheless, it turns out to be the case that at least in these two studies, cash turns out to be very hard to beat. Okay. Thanks a lot, Craig. Okay, thank you very much. All right, thanks everyone. So I'm gonna talk about uh, something fairly different, which is about measurement and how for to improve randomized experiments and in the course of doing randomized experiments, we can contribute to measurement. And this came up in my capacity as one of the co-chairs of the gender sector because you know, many people were interested in examining women's agency. So women's agency is this concept of women having some decision-making power, for example, and you know, they might want to look at it as a secondary outcome or they might want to do heterogeneity analysis and wanted to know what questions to use. And so I'm going to talk about a specific study that was trying to come, you know, sort of meet this demand that I, I was hearing from J. Powell affiliates and other people of like, you know, what questions should we use to, to measure uh, women's agency? And so, you know, what's different about women's agency than height or employment hours is it's, it's not as objective and it, there's not a clear cut uh, way to, to describe it. It would be what psychologists and other social scientists would call a latent construct. It's not something that's not really concretely there in the world, but it's an important concept that we might want to, to look at. But, and I think a lot of interventions, the pathway to working might be through giving women agency, or maybe some interventions will only work if women have agency. And even if we don't see changes in women's employment or earnings, having some freedom of choice in life is probably valuable per se. And so how do you typically measure something like this? You know, you take a bunch of survey questions. We, in our randomized evaluations, we're doing quantitative surveys of many people, so we'll have close-ended questions, you know, multiple choice questions, and we take a bunch of them and we turn them into an index. And so then the question is, you know, I've faced this myself, of how do you choose the questions? And sometimes there'll be experts who have come up with those indices, but, you know, they, they're aiming at the, the people who this is their main outcome, so there'll be 44 questions to measure self-esteem or you know, 17 questions to measure women's agency, but if it's your secondary outcome, you're often looking for something shorter. And so we, in this project that was funded by the Gates Foundation, we you know, were aiming to come up with like a method for choosing a small set of questions and concretely try to have a, some questions on, on women's agency. And so the, you know, the, the logic of, of what we try to do is say, well, let's try to measure it in some super complicated way, or you know, maybe complicated is not the right word, some rich 
nuanced way that isn't feasible when I go and do an, a 14,000 person RCT. But in a smaller sample, let me do that rich measure. And then let me think of that as the truth, or at least the best I can, can imagine getting. And then choose survey questions from a host of possible ones that seem to best correlate, basically, with that truth. So in our case, we, the study we did, we actually had two measures of the truth. One was qualitative interviews, where qualitative researchers did 45 minute to one hour open-ended conversations with women just where they talked about their lives and you know, talked about how much freedom of choice they had. And then we also did a lab game you know, where that has, uh, has a revealed preference benefit that people have some sort of money at stake as they're trying to reveal to you in their behavior their agency. And then, you know, this seemed like a really nice application of machine learning because, you know, I think in, in our causal work, we're starting to think of ways to use machine learning, but, you know, it's ultimately a prediction tool, and this is very much a prediction problem. We have, we're going to have two measures of, of, or lots of measures of agency, this really rich one, and then a bunch of survey questions, and it's an exercise of prediction of which of these closed-ended survey questions best match the truth. And so we did this, you know, and we did this as a standalone survey, but, you know, taking a step back, I think, you know, I, because we often are doing these rich measures in our RCTs for our primary outcome, we have an opportunity to use our RCTs to also try to validate some short survey modules. So just a little bit of what we did. We were specifically, you know, focusing in, in North India, so we took a, a representative sample of 21 villages, and we had uh, a sample of a little over 200 married women, and we collected two kinds of data on them. So first, we just took all of the contender questions on uh, women's agency that we knew of. So these were the kinds of questions you could put in a large RCT. We used the existing measurement tools to, to pick them, some of the, the, the uh, toolkit that Rachel and others had put together that was drawn from you know, various affiliate surveys, the demographic and health survey questions, which I think were a lot of researchers go to questions, but people weren't sure they were the best ones, and then some other kind of tools that, that are very common, very popular and common, but are longer. And so we're sort of agnostic about which ones will work. We're just going to see, you know, hopefully some of these 63 are good ones. And then we had qualitative, I should have said, this is with uh, two other people, Monica beard Volu, who's a qualitative sociologist, really led the, 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 sociology, the qualitative piece of this, where we had interviewers talk to women about their agency. And then we are ultimately doing a statistical exercise, so we code up those open-ended conversations from the transcripts into something quantitative across many domains, and we get a number you know, from that rich, time-consuming way of, of measuring agency. And so then the rest is you know, really the algorithms of, we have these 63 questions, we have this one measure of the truth, so how do we figure out which are the best questions? We chose to look at five questions. You, know, you could have taken three or seven, five seemed like what, what people wanted, and then we used three different algorithms, you know, partly because if each of these algorithms picks five different separate questions, you might be skeptical of the robustness of this. So we partly did this because they vary in how complicated they are, how transparent, and they're just different. Uh, and so they show us the robustness. Uh, and so you know, the font might be a little bit small, but you know, we kind of do this exercise. And we, in a nice way, we see that you know, across these three different methods, eight questions are selected. So there's a lot of overlap in the questions, and sort of more broadly, we, I think one of our things we learned is that you can kind of pick out, there's a set of maybe 10 of those 63 questions that all work pretty well, and you know, if you picked any, 10, any five of those 10, you'd probably do pretty well, but you know, it helps you uh, filter out the 50 that aren't doing a, a good job. And so you know, this is context specific in India, but you know, one of the questions looks like a, maybe a more specific, concrete version of the DHS question of, do you have, is your opinion heard when you make a large purchase, like a bicycle or a cow? Uh, but some of them, you know, you might not expect in other contexts, like are you, able, are you permitted to visit other women in your neighborhood? So that was a big predictor of kind of the holistic. Some other questions like on a ladder of 1 to 10, how much power do you feel you have in your own life? Like that question wasn't predictive at all. You know, you might think some of those holistic questions would work well. The concrete ones work better. You know, so as I said, taking a step back, I think, when we're all doing, we all have different research interests and we do our studies, and so, you know, what might be the central construct or outcome in my study where I'm putting a lot of investment in doing lab games or having some qualitative interviews, that's probably a secondary 
interest to someone else. And so, you know, like one of the things we tried to, to do here was both kind of do, you know, provide something for researchers who want to work on gender to measure agency, but you know, hopefully kind of think more, lay out a, a model of using our studies to try to create validated measures for other uh, researchers to use you know, when you want just a few off-the-shelf questions of, of some of these complex constructs. So thanks. Thanks a lot. So since the, the goal of this session is also to be a bit uh, prospective, so uh, uh, th there is a clear uh, added value of doing this within your study, but how do you see this more like for the sector or how this type of method could be useful to, to, to harmonize the data so that in the end we are all evaluating not the same thing, but outcomes that we can maybe aggregate better or, or discuss better? Yeah, no, so I think I, I sort of just framed it as some researchers want to know what five questions to use, you know, and, and this could be the five. I think there's also a value of having short modules so that we can, everybody, you could, if you have a few questions that people believe are actually valid, useful questions, and you could try to get all researchers to put these five questions. Maybe you'd want to do a three question version for that. You know, and so, so then even if a, a researcher women's agency was their main outcome. If I said, you know, use our 17 questions, they would usually say no, you know, in our context, we think those 17 are the best. But I think you could get people to agree, okay, we'll all use these five, and then the other 12 I use will be the ones that, you know, I've optimized for my setting and based on my local knowledge. And so it's striking a balance between allowing researchers the freedom they want to pick their question, but having a common set of questions so that we can, you know, make comparisons uh, across studies and across, um, you know, across contexts. You know, in this case, I, yeah, uh, we, we just focused on, on India. And so I think, you know, one, you know, like what's the broader vision is if you did this in many places, you could, what's optimal for India is not optimal for Uganda or Chile. And so in some ways, you know, that exercise you would want to be thinking kind of globally about what would be optimal. But even with, you know, all studies in India use three of these questions or these five questions and other ones, I think we would make some progress as we try to do meta-analyses and you know, comparisons across studies. So I think Rachel had a question. <laughs> India specific. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I think knowingly, right? Like we weren't, we were optimal, we, it's all internal in this setting. And so mobility is something that's huge in, in India, but you know, I don't think is as relevant in Ghana, for example. So what's, I mean, what would you think of an exercise, I mean, imagine there are, there are presumably donors who think globally of an exercise where someone took your methods. Let me, let me, let me be clear, like, I'm a, I would like to see this. <laughs> I yeah. would like to see this done in, you know, 100 countries. But, you know, the same method, and the, the, one, the one, cons one concern is how do you make the cross-country comparisons in a sense? Like you end up with the right five, but it's a different five in all, and and yet, yet you lose then the comparability, obviously, because they're different yeah. co different questions, and so you know you only can say within within country standard deviation shifts, right? I mean, but have you seen have you heard of anyone talking about let's do this in a hundred? And then no, also, you know my what real audience for this you maybe you know the the Gates Foundation is like a good. Uh, uh, entry point into this is like the demographic and health survey questions, right? So like the demographic and health survey, if you think of the counterpoint is the DHS is using the same four questions everywhere, but it's not clear they were ever, you know, vetted in a systematic way. And I bet you can improve on the DHS. And I mean, you know, I think qualitative interviews is a good benchmark you could do everywhere. And then you're talking about a different trade-off, which is there aren't gonna, you know, that what I, you have to decide, do I, the DHS said I'm gonna use the same questions they might not work as well in India as they do in Ghana, but that's fine. You could do an interim where you say, I'm gonna have you know, three questions that One are the same yeah. and then two are gonna be tailored. You know, but I think part of this is also about, um, yeah, like you know, tr doing something systematic. I think you know, it's intuitive to me and I think probably a lot of um, you know, people in the room that you, know, you want something to say these are the best questions. And so we do have many, we have a lot of innovations on richer ways of measuring things, like with lab games or with qualitative interviews. And so using something systematic to pick the best quantitative questions seems like it's, um, you know, makes a lot of sense intuitively to me. And I, I would love for this to be in like the DHS, for example. 
Craig, you want to say something? Yeah, I was just curious. I mean, it, we're all asking you the same. So like as a, as a stepping stone to that, have you tried cutting internally by religion, caste, education, and seeing how, how stable, stable it is. Yeah, we, um, you know, it's a small sample, so that I think that, you know, it, it, maybe the scalable way to do this is not qualitative interviews or ch some shorter qualitative interview or a lab game, something that you could have a sample of a thousand so you could start to do this external validity exercises to speak to that. We did 209, which Monica will, you know, reminds me all the time is like, you know, huge for doing qualitative and coding them. Maybe with AI techniques, she and she and uh, Biju Rao are like thinking about, oh, you know, could you use AI for some of these coding methods? Uh, I don't know if you can use chatbots to do the interviews as effectively, but you know, maybe there's some more scalable ways that would allow qualitative interviews. But yeah, I think you know, so I don't, I, I haven't, I mean, I'm love to hear thoughts on like concrete next steps. But, uh, but yes, I think that you know, you want some sense of what's externally valid. All right. Okay. Thank you. So we'll stay in the in the reality of data with uh, Poppy. We'll talk about uh, admin data in Indonesia. So I think we make the. Okay. No. Oh. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, as I mentioned, so my name is Poppy, and I'm going to take you um, on a journey <laughs> to sort of um, understand more about um, the experience of the JPL Service AI Office in using admin data in um, some of our RCTs. Basically, um, before going to uh, deep, deeper into that, we're just going to give you a snapshot of the projects that have been using admin data at the SEA office. So uh, at the moment, we have quite a few. Um, they're in various stages. And um, the way we use admin data is like, uh, the, the most common use is probably using it um, as a replacement of data collection, where uh, you use the admin data to sort of analyze the outcomes variables. But um, in our offices, we sort of use it throughout in different stages. So um, that's why I divided into um, you know, different categories. So, so we have, um, we use admin data for seven projects who are in a pre-RCD stage, meaning that um, they're in a pilot stage. We use this data to kind of like conduct our baseline, um, our, to test out our interventions and such. And um, there's also several, but well, still most of it are using it um, for data collection, meaning that we don't do surveys, but, on top of, but other than that, we replace it with like this huge admin data from government or partners. And we also use uh, admin data for intervention delivery. So in one of our RCTs, um, we have the data from the governments with list of beneficiaries and their addresses where we sort of like send out cards uh, to them and we use that data solely uh, to sort of all the logistical um, delivery of the cards and hence the, the intervention itself. And for the rest, um, I think a lot of um, what we're doing with admin data is also doing intervention monitoring. So. Um, we have a lot of RCTs up at the SEA office, which is a nationwide sort of um, projects where we evaluate social assistance programs to the government. So um, there's, a, there's a lot of that. So we, we're quite strong in the social protection aspects. Uh, what we use, uh, we use this admin data to sort of like say um, we had this intervention um, delivered. So it was basically the government programs all across 514 districts of Indonesia. And there's no way we're going to like uh, visit each one of those districts, right? Uh, to kind of like ensuring the randomization fidelity. So what we do is that we extract, we use, um, luckily the, the, the government partners and the state-owned banks partners, they have the admin data available for this. So we, we sort of able to monitor the progress of the of the interventions using this data. So that was a cost savings our side, but we also, um, we also see value in like going in person, but at least we don't have to visit all of them, right? Um, so, um, just several examples of what kind of admin data. This, this admin data is something that the government or our partners are, are already collected. It's not like something totally new. It's something um, as simple as the HR data. Maybe they have the list of staffs and um, the trainings that the staffs have, have gotten and how, when did they start, their salaries, their education, all those things. So those are very, very um, valuable information. We also use a lot like card transaction, da transaction data. This, this was used in one of our projects where we evaluate, um, we're trying to help uh, the public transport. So it's an organization, like the, this public uh, transport local government um, institution to sort of um, create an optimal demand model. So th this card tap data is, is very helpful. There's also electricity usage data and payments. Um, this is to evaluate uh, one of the electricity subsidy programs uh, during COVID-19. So that was helpful. Also a lot of school data, because we, as we start working with Ministry of Education, so they have this whole list and parameters of like 
score quality indexes that we can use and also test scores, um, of course, and, and score attendance and all that. So there's just a lot, a lot of this um, admin data, but the thing is that a lot of the partners, they don't realize that they have this data that they can actually do something with the data. So that's what we're here for. We, we sort of like uh, talk to them about all the possibil uh, possibilities in using this admin data. Below that, is it, these are just some of the sectors where we actually um, use this admin data. So, um, why admin data? Well, as you might <laughs> guess, um, it could like address some sources of bias, like recall bias when we do in-person surveys. And it might be cost efficient. I give you a map of Indonesia. You can see um, how um, um, spread out we are. We're separated by oceans. Can you imagine the transportation cost it would take if we were to cover the whole Indonesia? So that's why um, using admin data is like one of the way um, we can help the government or all our partners to kind of like evaluate a nationwide programs and yeah. Oh, on top of that, um, the government is also have this like regular semi-annual surveys that they conducted. So um, in, in one of our um, evaluations, we are just sort of like piggyback to that uh, survey a bit and added question. There has been also uh, another, um, uh, what do you call it, alternative <laughs> like data collections that we did. Um, now I'm going to talk to you about like some of the tips and some of lesson learned basically or what is it that we've learned um, in this past few years of using admin data. The first one is of course planning. Yeah. Um, planning for admin data need and access. Um, we also need to expect data lags, although the data is there, but they need time to sort of like extract it, transfer it, and making sure the data security protocol is in place. It is that lags there. And, um, the last one, particularly important, is maintaining team morale. Sometimes there's just a lot of back and forth processes. There's uh, some downtime um, also when we use admin data. So like um, focusing on your team instead of like being a cheerleader also works. <laughs> um, so let me go on the first one. Um, planning for um, admin data needs and access. We need to understand uh, what data is available before the study begins. Um, like we need, uh, when we talk to the government or like, or partners on potential research projects, um, and they say, oh, we have all those data. But really, <laughs> you have to check <laughs> because <laughs> there might be like several variables that's missing. Uh, you don't know the quality of it. So you really need to think about if it is really is possible to use this admin data and incorporate that to your plan. Um, or, or some extent of like data collection is still needed there. And most importantly, um, okay, so it passes the check. It says, that, oh, the government, we have it, it's good. But then you also need to think about the strategy of obtaining those data. Um, where are the potential sources of data? Which department has it? So that's very important because then you need to engage with the right people and the key champions in Indonesia. Um, a lot of our government partners tend to be very, you know, bureaucratic in a way. So you need to figure out which way to go um, in order to get this data. And we 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 also found that having um, buy-in from high-level officials is important. This is why we encourage our PIs to come to Indonesia and kind of like present to these um, high-level officials. They're usually very welcoming uh, to, to PIs and um, research ideas. So. It's great to build cred credibility and trust. They want to, to, to be like, you know, trust us. Um, not only the high official, the technical staff is also very important. Say, during those um, high level official meeting, we usually ask, so who is the person in charge that, my st uh, that our team member could reach out to? So um, this technical staff, sometimes they could have even more power than the high official because they're like, nope, nope, I'm not going to give it to you. But um, that's why you need to also build that, that relationship. Um, and lastly, the administrative processes involved in the data request. Sometimes it's not as straightforward as data use agreements. Because um, if the, the data is, you know, belongs to a different department, each department might need to have different NDAs. And you need to kind of like take into account the time needed to kind of like get all those things signed. And also, um, we also need to be aware about like, the need to ensure intellectual property um, of our own work, although the data is theirs, but when we um, you know, analyze the creative papers, uh, results and stuff, those uh, needs also, the, the IP should be ours so that we can, we're able to publish, and also exit clause. In case 
um, the evaluation didn't work out, you need like um, a room to, to wiggle your way out. <laughs> so that's very important to note in this. Um, I only have one minute, so I'll go to the next one. Um, this is on expecting da data lags and be prepared for it. Like I said, you need to be patient, I guess. Uh, you need to allow time for data provider to extract the data. Uh, you need to prepare and ask questions to anticipate risk because along the way, initially they say yes, but in the middle of it, suddenly there's these new data protection law um, introduced by the government and they were like, oh, oh I'm, I'm, I'm very reluctant to give it to you. So you need to anticipate all those. There's, there might even be a reorganization within, uh, within the, the department, which the news that I received this morning from my team members that, oh, oh we cannot move forward with this um, admin data project because there's a reorganization um, within the department. So you need to be able to like, ask questions, be updated, um, and we need to maintain our presence to be like on the radar of this partner because hey, we're here, we're asking for data, we still need the data, don't forget about us. So that's very important. And the third one, um, I think working with admin data, um, it requires, I mean, it's not as physically exhausting as like collecting in-person data where you have to manage these field teams, but like mentally it is sort of exhausting kind of. Because you need to like go back and forth. You need to ensure the administrative processes is there, um, and all those, uh, all, and you even need to convince the partners sometimes that you have the data security protocol in place. So don't worry, we'll keep your data safe. So that needs like very very um, hard or convincing. Uh, so you need to kind of like um, support the team members there um, and. So there's several suggestions of what we can do during this downtime. We can like keep this team member busy doing other things like preparing analysis code, master code, and refine roles and responsibilities, set up equipments uh, once the data is there. Are we ready when the data is com comes? Do we have all the necessary equipment? And all those sort of things. And one last thing, um, knowing when to stop and when to continue pushing the partners is also very important. So I guess that's for me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Poppy. Uh, so it seems that getting admin data is not necessarily faster than survey data, if I understand that. Mm, depends. <laughs> depends on the partner and the circumstances. <laughs> but once you get the partner, then it's, uh, yeah, it's ready for. I was yeah. just wondering, because you did not talk too much about outcomes. So because, of course, one limitation sometimes we, we think about admin data is that it's only on specific outcomes. Could you maybe elaborate a little bit on this for the different research projects? So which outcome did you get with this admin data? And, and maybe. More generally, do you have any like uh, also recommendation for? Because it seems that you, you are the champion of this uh, collaboration in in this context. But what recommendation for other countries and uh, in, in in getting this uh, this this uh, collaboration? Um, okay, sorry. Um, on example, I'll give you one example of our ongoing project. Uh, this is with the tax department in Indonesia. So. Basically, um, we are asked to do an impact evaluation for their organizational effect effectiveness sort of. So um, one, um, one of their staff, the, 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 the one in charge of, uh, what do you call it, taxpayers. So one staff is in charge of like 3,000 taxpayers and stuff. So <laughs> we're trying to help them to kind of optimize uh, the HR um, allocations and um, providing like a quantitative value of one additional staff um, to tax data collection or tax revenues. So we use uh, the, their admin data. So they have a very, very extensive um, admin data on say, yeah, tax revenue, um, taxpayers, and also like um, all the different trainings that the, the staff is doing, their salaries, their education backgrounds and stuff. So we're sort of, uh, and also their um, rotation history as well. So I guess we could track, um, this, um, if there is a particular characteristic of certain staff that could be, uh, what do you call it, most efficient in, in doing, um, what, in, in collecting um, tax revenues and sort of that. Um, so that's one. Uh, second, we also evaluated like a social assistance program. So we use um, the government's um, surveys here. So we added a questions, um, a social protection model that we worked together with, with the Ministry of National Development Planning. We added several outcomes, like because the project was like, uh, the study was about reforming um, a social assistance program. So we wanna know 
if this new program is actually better than the old one. So we have several um, outcomes there that, that was agreed uh, with the government, such as the, the amount of rice that they actually get, the quality of, of rice, uh, and then the ease of access, and the welfare, um, the welfare outcomes. So that's available in that survey. So we can use that um, in our um, study. So, so that, what was this, the second question, sorry. So, um, so I was uh, asking about um, advice. Sorry, advice for. Oh yeah, no, sorry, sorry. The, oh, the okay. different recommendation for. Sorry, sorry for the. Um, <laughs> <laughs> recommendation. Okay. Um, so I each mean. projects have their own different <laughs> characteristics, basically. But what we'd like to do um, every time there's a project using admin data is definitely uh, the stakeholder engagement is key. So. Um, I don't know if it is similar in other contexts, but in Indonesia, uh, they value trust. So the government likes to build trust first. You need to talk to them like a lot. That's what a lot of, a lot of our, our A's do. Uh, they are doing um, a lot of stakeholder engagement, meaning that they meet with the technical staff often. They provide updates if there is anything, you know. And then we also uh, created a training, a customized trainings as well for, for our government partners. So. Um, one of, uh, the, I think with the, with the tax department, what we did was that we had a data management training for their staffs because that's something that they wanted, uh, th they felt very valuable. Um, and we also have like a smaller RCT trainings, uh, impact evaluation, so something that's practical for them. So they really value that a lot. And um, secondly, um, another example is that we have a, we have a project with um, state-owned banks back in 2016 until 2020. And then they wanted uh, to do another impact evaluation with us uh, starting in 2021 till now. And I think the, the, what they value from that is that, um, that also like the insights and the evidence sharing basically. So um, at the moment, uh, say we have an initiative on financial inclusion or uh, on MSMEs, and this is something that the state owned banks are very interested about. So we kind of like collaborate with the PCT, the initiative team to sort of um, give um, this evidence sharing and um, white paper insights, and they found that to be valuable. So I think we just invest a lot on those relationships, and, and, and our RAs are, they're pretty good at kind of like picking up things that might help in, you know, building relationship, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I think Sima is a, a, no, no, that's yeah. Okay. No, other questions? I think we're on time, uh, so, yeah. Okay, we need to okay. Yeah. <laughs> thanks, thanks a lot. Thank you. <laughs> And our last presenter oh. is uh, Dean. But you know, you have slides. No, it's okay. Then. I, yeah, I'm, I don't have confidence. That, that <laughs> yeah, okay, that's, that's good. Go so I'm going to go without slides. It has nothing to do with the fact that I didn't prepare any. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, hi everybody. Um, so, I was going to. I want to sh share some thoughts about mega studies, multi-site studies, which I'll try to define. Um, there's a spectrum of what is meant, meant by that. It actually picks up on a lot of some of the issues that we're trying to solve when we've seen some of these done, or actually, you know, all four of these presentations are, whoops, I'm sorry, three, <laughs> I looked at sorry, you, right, <laughs> yeah, are feeding into some of the issues that, that a multi-site study is trying to do, you know, kind of commonality and measurement. There's, you know, kind of comparisons to some commonality at using admin data. You know, all these are different pieces to the way, we, the way we've seen it. But what's, let me start by just first trying to say what I see is what's the problem we're trying to solve or what's the market failure within us as a community that is that is that excites me about the promise of doing multi-site and kind of mega studies. And so the first is, um, the first problem is that as I think everybody knows, but yet sometimes it's hard to stand by, you know, to kind of adhere to, you know, we should never get too excited by any one study. You know, we learn a lot, but everything's building on something else, and we learn something, but you know, no one study ever completely should shut shuts the door and answers all questions. So, like in terms of, oh, and I don't overselling, but also just recognizing that we should, you know, we need to see more replication, more strength of validity across different contexts, and kind of pushing the boundaries of of the lessons we learn from any one study and and expanding in that way. And um, but. So you know, I think we can all get around that principle. I said it in a very hand-wagging way. I don't think anybody would disagree. Of course, the application of that is very, very you know, can be tricky. But 
you know, how do you solve that? Well, you know, yes, you'd solve that through having some, some ability to start comparing and building in a way. And our current way of consistently doing that, and a lot of papers that do this I think are great and we learn a lot, is from more of a kind of a synthesis model, like a handbook chapter, an annual review chapter, right? And you can learn a lot when you take someone who really knows the literature well and kind of weaves together a common story that we're learning across. But you inevitably always are missing some sort of um, control over the process to be able to make clean comparisons. And so the, you know, the core idea of any sort of concept, what I'm about, you know, with multi-site or mega study is about removing some of the variation so that we can make better comparisons and, and see what are the results that are kind of transcending across. What's the market failure within ourselves for doing this? Well, there's uh, obviously coordination costs are quite high for doing it. And there's also basic incentive problems too. Um, when, I, when I started IPA, actually before it was called IPA, Innovations of Private Action, it was called Development Innovations. And I remember still the memo I wrote as a, you know, just finishing graduate school to Esther and Abhijit and Sendhil um, to say, hey, you know, here's, here's some problems and here's, you know, here's an idea. And one of, the, one of the big points on there was, who's gonna do the next teaching at the Balsaki study, which we heard about this morning, who's gonna do the next one? And who's gonna do the one that, that starts teasing out the right student-teacher ratio? And you know, how do we have an entity that has those incentives to do that replication, the operational kind of tests? And, um, and so that was you know, very much kind of the motivation, but, but it's still very hard to, you know, we have to create the right incentives within our system or, or cover those coordination costs somehow through some public goods in order to create that kind of um, that environment to make that, to make that work. Um, there's also a risk of, and I'll get into some examples of what I mean by these in more concrete, but there's a risk that I want to just stress that I would never want to see us lose, which is the, the creativity that we get from having a bunch of one-off projects and the creative energy and the new ideas and things like this. And so, um, you know, we always want a world where we shouldn't be in a corner solution, that's all. Okay. Um, and there are some of the multi-site things that I think have found ways to try to embrace some of that creativity. I'll give you an example of one. Um, so the, you know, one, one broad point is that when we're trying to kind of control factors, one of the, one of the first ones that I was involved in um, was the, the, the study that was mentioned up there, the ultra poor graduation study, which was some people from here were also involved in. Um, and here's where we took six sites to do this one social protection program in a fairly coordinated, but in hindsight could have done a much better job, and that's on me, partly, largely. Um, but it was fairly coordinated across the six with the intent to, to pool and put them together from the, from the very beginning. But when we put the results out, there was, so even though we managed to get rid of a lot of the variation that you would have if you just had six kind of multifaceted social protection programs and you're trying to draw a common thread. So there was a lot of things that we did manage to remove so that we could make some clean comparisons. But there were a lot of factors. And so when we have six different results from six countries with six different average treatment effects, inevitably, and we had nine co-authors on this project, those of those sites, inevitably people would always say, well, how do you explain the difference across countries? Right? And, and so even though we got rid of a lot of the variation, we still had a, you know, 10 different reasons I can name that would maybe explain. And so the, 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 the challenge there is the, the, the golden rule of meta-analysis, which I'll admit I made up, is that thou shalt have more data points than co-authors, <laughs> right? And so, you know, we were always just left going, you know, sure, in one site I can tell you some operational thing went wrong and that would explain that one site, but the others, I, you know, it was, it was hard to pinpoint and be, be decisive. So there's always a, there's a constraint to how much we can learn, but the more we can kind of control how many factors are varying, the more we can learn. But there's a, there's a trade-off that happens in that. When you go really narrow, you can go you know, super, super narrow, and, you know, and then you know, you're just varying one thing and you can really learn a lot. Um, my first failed attempt at doing that was with charitable giving. Um, tried working with some marketing firms doing fundraising to only vary the ask strings that you get when you get asked to give money. Is it you know, 10, 25, 50, and it was just like the dream was like, we're gonna do 10,000 of these experiments. And, 
and just vary that one thing and then have lots and lots of rich data, right? So that's a really narrow and the really broad are things like, things like the ultra poor study where there's a lot of different moving parts and so you might learn something that's a bit broader about the average treatment effects of larger studies, um, but you're gonna lose the ability to kind of isolate the, 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 you know, the one thing that varies. So, um, okay, so the, the, the key thing here in, in terms of, I wanna describe what I mean by some of these studies and, what, and where, the, where I see the obstacles are for, for doing these, but, but I do think there's a lot of windows for doing this. So I, I'm not like, I, I think these obstacles are almost all overcomable. Think of, I think about them as looking backwards and looking forward. So there's some that you can look backwards, you can do meta-analysis. So we've been involved in some, some doing with Chris and William on CASH, that's the study that Craig mentioned, where we're using the, the point estimates from studies, not the underlying data. There's another one on entrepreneurship where we use the data, we actually have the micro data and do a lot of syncing. It takes a lot of time to do that syncing. Even with all that syncing, there's a lot that we just, there's a lot of instances where we just, you know, you, 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 you put a parameter on a study saying number of hours of training and you, and you think you can use that parameter in a meta-analysis, but of course we all know that it's different content on the training. You can't parameterize the content of the training really. So there's a limit to how much you're gonna learn and there's a lot of things when you're looking backwards that you actually just don't know. There's different measurements. So this goes back to kind of what Simo was talking about. And you know, they're, they're, they measure employees differently, they measure the, what's the definition of employee, what's the definition of revenue, all these differences when you look backwards. So, so I think there's a lot we can do, but, but there's a certain limit. So when we look forward, then that's where I think you know, we have a lot of opportunity to be more, more, more coordinated in our planning going forward. So I don't think, I think we need to do more of both, to be clear. But going forward, then we, you know, we see a few different venues, or at least I see a few different venues where I think it's exciting, they're exciting opportunities. <coughs> One goes to the admin data. So there's a lot of contexts where they're, particularly these days, we're seeing more of this. Think of social media, think of banking data, mobile money data, where there's massive platforms and you can, you can set up you know, potentially repeated studies with, with a plethora of researchers, but with the commonality that is a fixed cost that is paid for by some, you know, club, kind of club good or donor um, to feed off of the same data structure. Uh, Katie Milkman and Angela Duckworth at University of Pennsylvania have been doing work that's similar to this, where they, you know, they do all the hard work. I honestly, I feel like I'm cheating almost when I work with them because you just get to like throw in ideas and be creative and they do all the hard work and fixed cost of working with the partner, getting the admin data, things like this. And you know, we just got an email one day that said, congratulations, one of your treatment arms was in the top five. We were very excited until we got the details the next day and it was our placebo arm that did so well. <laughs> um, but you, you know, a tremendous amount can be learned that way. Obviously it's constrained and someone has to like pay that fixed cost of setting that up. They did these partnerships with banks and and um, on flu shots across America, things like this. The other, the other context is, is more complicated and requires more fixed costs in, in, is when we're doing kind of program evaluation work that's similar to like the ultra poor graduation or any sort of, you know, could be an agricultural extension. And there's two types of context in which I think we can do more of those. One is we can do more when it is a large complicated studies and there's you know, survey methods and measurement and lots of complications. But that, you know, the, the rewards from that type of coordination are huge when influencing policy. You know, we, I've seen this over and, over and again with the graduation studies. The fact that we had those six together made a huge difference in conversations with policymakers. Um, it was much more powerful than here's a synthesis article which is weaving a story across six papers that are seemingly related. Um, it was, a, it was a very different conversation having that. So one is in that context. The other which I'm particularly excited about is on more add-on operational research. So suppose, for instance, there's a large donor that is doing the same thing across 70 countries or similar things across 70 countries. Agricultural extension work across 70 places. Working in schools in 50 countries. Different things, what they're doing in schools, different things in ag, but one commonality they're doing that. They're already going in, they're collecting yields, they're doing testing, and someone said, you know what, let's find out how to optimize the integration of messaging parents about 
the children's educational opportunities and what they're doing. Let's, let's, tech, let's message farmers consistently with weather forecasts across 70 countries. Let's, I had a couple others in here. <laughs> well, okay, I'll, in, in the interest of time, I'll, I won't name the others, but if you can do things like that and then overlay that on top of a lot of other programs, feeding off of the data that those programs might have already been collecting, right, then you can potentially learn so much more than any one messaging study in one place. I've done a bunch of messaging studies on savings. The variance in what we find across site is huge. Right? And I don't have good answers because we don't have enough volume on it. It's just why does it work amazingly well in some and not in others? And so, you know, but having, having more, more control over a large set like that could be very promising. Um, and there's a lot of players that I think can do that. You know, there's large bilateral donors that work in lots of countries. Um, um, and there's also large INGOs and that, that do operate a lot you know, very similar programs across lots of countries. And so there are, I think, partners that have that high level ability to say, yeah, we want to do this. It doesn't mean it's going to work in every, every location. But I think that kind of ambition should have payoffs by incurring that fixed cost uh, of, of coordination and then allowing, um, you know, some flexibility site by site to figure out how to, how to do it, when to do it, what data, but then pulling it all together and learning a much stronger aggregate lesson from that process. So um, one thing I would say is if, if people have ideas on things that are kind of that nature of like, hey, here's something that's common that is done around the world across, you know, you know in agriculture, education, health, and if there's a, you know, a player who's, whether they're an implementer or a donor that has their hands across many countries and you think there's an idea that can feed across, um, by all means, please reach out to me and if I have any ideas on someone who might be interested in making that happen, I'd be happy to brainstorm with you and think about how to make that happen. Thanks, Dean. Uh, maybe just uh, I have a question that relates to the first presentation of, of Craig on cost. I was just wondering, so yeah, how do you relate this to, to cost? I mean, maybe for the mega studies, it's, it's simple because the cost will be already uh, fixed, but for like the other type of method that you suggested, so if we want to move uh, the way a policymaker will take the evidence, they need also uh, to have the cost, and here there is a lot of heterogeneity, I guess. No? The heterogeneity in the in the cost of yeah, cross sites yeah, and doing yeah. things, in, in, even in the way that people report the cost. And uh, yeah. oh, yeah, no, I mean in that sense, it's similar similar to what you know the thing that I'm you know been excited about from the first time I heard uh, about SEMA's work. Um, not just today, you know, before, yeah, yeah. was, wow, this would be really exciting to see this in lots of places. Same, same thing on, on cost, too. Um, IRC has been leading a really nice effort on this in the humanitarian space, for what it's worth, mm -hmm. on, on really trying to systematize um, gathering of cost data um, from a, a, f a former j Peller who's there, Caitlin Selleck. Um, and, and so there's some really exciting work that they've been coordinating across many of their peer humanitarian groups. But that's just the tip of the iceberg for what's needed on that. Absolutely, we 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 um we have shockingly little understanding about what drives costs across, and the you know the fundamental problem that we always face is, um, do you you know if like the, we face this very much on the ultra poor graduation work when we tried extrapolating that to some other place. Let's say some other place doesn't have an RCT, but we want to say well what do we think their impact is. Um, and all we know is, you know, the cash is easy that you can compare that, but if everything else is twice as expensive, what do you assume? Do you assume constant returns or do you, uh, like, we don't know. We don't know why it costs twice as much in that country versus the first and whether they, that's because they were, t or were they twice as good? Should you assume the same percent return or the same nominal return? You get a very different answer mm -hmm. depending on what you do and we just don't understand these things very well. So I completely agree that we need, we need more systematic understanding of the cost structures across places. Question from the panel. I think we should let the audience. Ah, yeah. yeah. So then I think we yeah. can open the discussion to the audience. So, question about any uh, intervention. So we have around ten minutes. I'll take the mic. Fifteen. Okay. Okay. Very. That's true. <laughs> There's a question over there. Oh, 
my question is yeah. for Seema. Um, we don't, we're not that great at collecting qualitative data in economics. So I guess do you have any broader lessons from that if we want to um, bring that into our own work more? And I guess in your particular context, if you're choosing between kind of a lab game or like a quantitative behavioral outcome versus the qualitative, how would you think about trading off those two options? Yeah, so the, um, I think you know, this project has made me more keen to add um, trained qualitative collaborators uh, to my projects, you know, because uh, it's something kind of related to working with remote sensing that we bring something to the table of ground truth data and remote sensing people bring something. I think this is another two-way street because, you know, our ways of sampling and our infrastructure is very valuable for a qualitative researcher. So, like, you could write a qualitative study per se. And, you know, there, we probably know some of, like, Raj Chetty's where it's incorporated into the main study. But, you know, if it's – we can professionalize what we all do informally. So, uh, you know, I, th I think what's missing there and – and maybe j -PAL or other organizations could help is like that match mark making. There probably are some qualitative researchers who would happily have, um, you know, something, a, a setting to, to then go and do qualitative research and that's, you know, we get outsourced to a, an expert, the qualitative part. Um, yeah, you know, when, we, when we're thinking about the best way to measure it, measure something, uh, you know, like in all of our studies, forgetting what I did, you know, we often as researchers try to have some revealed preference measures because economists like want to see behavior and, you know, probably, so when we did our validation, we like intentionally did a revealed preference and a qualitative. Like in our setting, I think the qualitative w was richer because like our lab games are almost necessarily like narrow in what they, financial agency is what we picked up. and. And so I guess it kind of matters, you know, how specific you are. Our lab games are useful when, or even in other work I've done where we can look at, you know, like attitudes about dowry system. You know, you have, they're so logistically complicated that you have to pick one specific part of a, a construct. I guess what I liked about the qualitative interviews is you can cover something much more holistic about one of these constructs. Yes. Okay, um, so Craig, I wanted to come back to your point about um, your the, the cash over, you know, of different amounts. Um, and I was just thinking, Oriana Bandiera came to talk recently and she was talking about the challenge of comparing with different quantities and how, particularly if you just look, now you had lots of different outcomes and this bit relates to Dean's question to you, but it's if with different amounts of money you might, if you just look at consumption, for example, you, you know, if you get enough money and you believe a poverty trap model, then, you know, then you're only going to invest over a certain amount. And so you, like, what's the right measure? Is it consumption or is it investment? And those might be very different. And so trying to do a linear um, thing across the, the amounts in, within consumption or within investment might be, you know, you, you might be getting a really, you know, uh, the wrong picture, right? Um, so that, that was, I don't know how much, you, how much you've engaged with her on that, but it um, seems like she's got, you know, a point there about the different combinations of how you might react. Um, and then just on, I just wanted to follow up on that qualitative point because, um, when I was working on with some qualitative researchers on an empowerment study, and you know, I was getting the feedback that you like our instinct is to bring the sampling, and you know, the things that we bring at the sampling and turning it into a number. And the pushback I got was you're trying to turn the qualitative into quantitative, and you're missing the thing that is good about what we do. And um, you don't actually want a representative sample. You want to, you know, you want to sample like the extremes to because you learn more about the women who actually manage to work in a society where nobody else works. And so you don't want to bring representative sample. You don't want to do, you know, hundreds of women like it's all about doing. So I didn't. Um, you obviously work with someone who had a different response. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so and let me make a distinction between, you know, what we did in our study, we 
needed to turn it into a number and code, right? So I guess I took Emily's question to be broader of like, you know, in a study where I'm not trying to do any machine learning and find a module, you know, qualitative, um, you know, you, you, you could just, I guess what I'm saying is like, rather than us having a few surveyors do some open-ended questions to flesh out the mechanisms discussion in a paper, like we could engage with professional qualitative researchers and they could do things. You know, on the sampling, yeah, maybe it's, we do have a, a treatment and a control. So if you wanted to say like, how does an intervention, you know, qualitatively change people within our treatment and group and control group? Yeah, maybe we do want to let that researcher say, no, I don't, I want to choose based on the outcome to understand the cases where it worked and didn't work, et cetera. And, uh, and so I kind of actually kind of agree with that point, but I, I guess in terms of having this setting of an intervention where you could have like transformational changes and you could understand the nuance of how that happened. Um, yeah, like I, you know, I, not everyone, people have their own re research agendas and might find that uninteresting, but I, you know, I guess I find uh, our infrastructure on the ground is, is like a real asset that lots of people, you know, uh, like I think we, we can bring to, to qualitative researchers. So I, I would say there are places where these nonlinearities and benefits are really interesting in and of themselves, and like the poverty trap argument is, is definitely one of those. Um, I think it's going to be very context specific. I think even that poverty trap argument is very context specific and is limited to a you know a specific type of asset in a in a specific type of uh, 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 for for a specific type of person. I think the broader point that we're trying to make is that at some level, when you start thinking in this way that you know basically benefit cost ratios are themselves contextual in a way that people don't tend to think of them as being contextual. And so to make this an empirical conversation, you have to be able to vary scale in quite a sensitive way. And there are interventions for which that's straightforward and interventions for which that's virtually impossible. Um, so it does end up being a lopsided race. And it's kind of like the pushback that we've gotten a lot on this study is that you can ask all these rich questions with cash, and then you're actually not asking any of those rich questions with the, with the in-kind intervention. So I, I don't have like a single clear answer for your very good question. But I think basically I would say, like, I think that this provokes the idea that we do need to be recognizing any time that we're making benefit cost comparisons, that those are located at a certain scale and are context specific in that way. And so there's this additional open question about how they would vary if you varied scale as well. Uh, hi, this uh, is mostly a question for Dean. So now we're talking about the innovations in, in RCT methods and you're suggesting these like multi-site and, and mega studies, but I think one question that we also um, now in the maturity of RCTs in our field are often faced with is this question of like, when is there enough evidence to uh, implement something without uh, RCT evidence, like if without evaluating it again? And so how do you think about these two, like the tension of those two against each other? Running RCTs are expensive, it's time consuming. Um, how do you think about when when do you recommend that? When do you recommend doing like a really, really good piloting to see whether it could potentially work in a context and not run at full scale RCT? Um, no, it's a great question, one that, yeah, I mean, I, I can give you some thoughts and I'm not claiming to have the answers. Um, but, you know, you know, I think we can all agree on two things. More than one is good. Fewer than you know, 100 is probably you know, good. <laughs> Taking a number there. Being a little careful what the number should be. <laughs> um, so, you know, somewhere in between. <laughs> um, you know, I've thought a little bit about when, you know, how do we figure out in a given situation what it is? And my best hand-waving answer is when, you know, there's, there's a kind of a quant empirical answer I have, which is, well, you know, ha, you know look at the evidence that's there already and, you know, ha, ha, what's kind of, in a sense, what's our R squared <laughs> on understanding the treatment effects? And do we understand them well enough to be able to extrapolate to another context or not? Um, the, the qualitative answer would be, uh, you know, I've never done it exactly this way, but like in a sense, 
poll a bunch of policymakers, and if they're not listening because they don't think the evidence is enough, well, then it's not enough. Um, if you're not moving the needle on policy because people are asking, you know, good, solid questions about, like, yeah, that was interesting, but, like, over here, no. Um, then that's a call to arms to do more. That's my, that's my hand, you know, that's my non-quant answer. But, um, You mentioned that we were close to a standard of care, but like, what gives you that confidence? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I have a tendency to give a quantitative answer to the question, so I mean, I think it, it's, uh, I, I would go a little past the R squared. I think that there's, a, there's partly a Bayesian answer to this question, which is essentially what's the, what's the marginal learning value from an additional data point. Uh, there's partly an R squared answer to this, which is basically uh, what's the standard error on the uncertainty across studies. And then I think there's also very importantly a heterogeneity answer to this question too, because a lot of a lot of the things that we need to know are really about, you know, the the evidence base is mostly here, but I want to do it over there, and is that context going to matter differentially or not? And so I mean I think obviously intuitively the cases where you're going to feel that fewer studies is better is where the standard errors across studies are lower and where the heterogeneity within and across studies are lower, and that's gonna get you closer to a sense that the answer to this actually isn't context specific, and therefore, because I mean, the context is always different, right? You can always, it's, it's post-COVID now, we don't know, right? So, so the, the context is always different, and so I think you don't get to the confidence level of being able to say, just do it, unless you have a sense that context doesn't matter, um, and, and that, I would say cash is probably closer to that than anything else that I see in, in uh, the economic sphere. I think we're at, in our meta-analysis, we're at 85 unconditional cash transfer papers. Oh. Into That's the, why you chose 100 as your... <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, giving yourself some... <laughs> well, we didn't do the 85. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We got 14 more to go, and then, we, then we can stop. Uh, question here? There's a question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, I had a question on the benchmarking. Um, and I was wondering if you had thoughts on how important was the control group. Um, and for example, in a situation where you can only have two groups, um, should we always go for one control, one treatment? Or there could be cases where it would be more interesting to have um, treatment and benchmark with cash without a control group. Yeah, so in a way, I think it actually relates fairly closely to the previous question, which is what is your level of confidence that the non-cash intervention works? Um, and so in some sense, like uh, in both of our studies, the non-cash intervention was pretty disappointing. And that makes the entire benchmarking premise a little disappointing as well, that it's like, you know, it's this head-to-head -head where one of the heads didn't really, it didn't really move. So I think that, uh, I think that if, you, if you were benchmarking against an intervention that you were very sure was effective in an environment where you're also very sure that cash is effective, I could see letting the control grow, uh, go, rather, sorry. But the, but the more uncertainty you have about the non-cash arm, the more you're gonna be in this very vague and ambiguous space, for example, to not find a significant difference between them in a circumstance where you don't have a control group. So. The upside of the other arm not working is you escape Seema's question, um, because you didn't have to worry about the cash losing. We did not. Um, yeah, I know you didn't plan it that way. So I have a... On. Um, I have a suggestion for when is enough. Um, I think maybe it's enough when you understand why the program is working in some places and not others. When you've got an understanding of, of how the context is, is, is shaping the responses. Um, I don't know if we're there on anything yet. <laughs> but that, but that's, that's, I think that's when I would be satisfied. So, okay, within study, Easy, right? I mean, variations. Across, who's going to do the study? When your theory says it's not going to work over there, who's going to go do it over there? So, I mean, I, you know, there's, I, I, I agree, but at the same time, I struggle with that on uh -huh. if we, you know, at some point we have to just rely on the theory and say, no, we're not going to test deworming in Manhattan to solve truancy problems in, in Manhattan. <laughs> like, we're, we're going to rely on our theory over here. <laughs> So it's a mix, I think. Yeah. Is maybe time for a last question? Yeah. Yes, uh, Dean, have, have you thought of the best model to launch a call in order to encourage it? Because incentives are key. So let's say we want to launch a call now from the World Bank on gender and climate, right? 
I mean, but you have the trade-off that you want to have as many different styles as possible, as you're saying. Maybe the idea that we discussed on data earlier on a common question for everyone, and then you can vary would be the option. But precise question, is it better to have one centralized teams that manage all the RCTs, or, or is it okay to have different teams running the same question everywhere? Oh, I, I wouldn't put us in a corner solution on that. I think that's a, um, you know, there's institutional, there's funders, there's who's the implement implementer that are gonna drive what's optimal in a given, a given context. I mean, you know, the, you know, William and Chris and I have been involved in a couple of these that had um, now like kind of a core with some people working more on some versus the other. Um, and, you know, I think it worked, it's worked quite well. Um, you do need people who are not, you, yeah, you need people who are gonna be fundamentally cooperative and not obsessed about, um, you know, not or, or okay with papers with many authors on them and things <laughs> like this. But, but I don't think, I, I could imagine situations where one of, where one is better than the other and depends on the, who the people are and the donors and the implementers to see how coordinated it is. How much, how much does it just let people do things that are slight coordination and then you come back at the end and pool some things versus really needing to like plan everything along the way with constant meetings and collaboration. So. Okay. Yeah. So I think time is up. I would like to thank a lot the, the, the panel uh, and for, for their, their, their great uh, contribution <laughs> on the snapshot of, of innovations and cost effectiveness, measurement, generalizability. So uh, this is part of all the innovations that, that happen, and I hope there will be uh, other opportunities to talk about other innovation in the, in the next years. Uh, so thanks a lot. And I would also like to, to thank the red team uh, that uh, helped a lot in, organization, in, in the organization of this event, and uh, 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 Jack Cabana, Sarah Goat, and Sarah Copper. Thanks so much for, for your help on this. Thank you very much. Bye -bye. <laughs>